So last week we introduced this series in the Lord's Prayer with an anthem from the choir that talked about the disciples asking Jesus to teach them to pray because they saw him and they saw what he was dealing with, what he was confronting, how he was living, and he saw, they saw him going away. Um, for these times away in solitude to pray, and they saw the power with which he returned after those times. And so they asked him to teach them how to pray, to teach them how to receive that power from God. This series is simple as the air we breathe, but it's everything, because we wouldn't be alive without it. This series is about how we bring God's power into our lives, how we open our heart, our soul, and mind and strength so that it is God living within us, God working through us, so that it's not us alone trying to accomplish all of the spiritual fruits, all of the ways of living, all of the goodness that we feel called to, that can be pretty impossible in the midst of the brokenness that we encounter and the battles that we are called to fight. In this world and in this living, there will be more than we can handle. But there won't be more than we can handle with God when it is God's power in us and through us and with us. And so we come to this time of prayer, of what it means to invite that power into our lives, of what it means to be intentional about growing that power in us so that there's more and more of it. And so we come to this very first phrase of the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when they're asking how to access this power and how to make it a part of their beings and their daily lives. And this prayer starts with our. Before we even get to the name of who we call God, the very first word is a reminder that we're not alone. The very first word, even when we follow the scripture that Molly read just before of going into our closets and closing the door and praying in private, we don't say my father, we say our. The very first word is to remind us that there are brothers and sisters in Christ all around this world in this journey with us. And that there is a community of saints with us as well. For all who have died are alive in God. And that life is present with us whether we're on this side of the river or the next. So we start with our. Because even if we're praying on our own, we are not on our own. And so we come together on Sundays as a corporate body, not business sense, but as the Latin corpus sense, as the whole body to get just a little bit more of a glimpse of that full universal body of Christ. We're not even talking about just the global Methodist church here. We're talking about every single person all around the world who follows Christ. Every single person in the community of saints that have gone before us to pave the way to make this worship day here possible. And all of those who will continue after us to carry this journey and this kingdom and this good news forward. Our. We're together. And it is our Father. And we're going to talk about what it means for God to be father or mother or the gender of God later on um, next fall, this coming fall. But for now, I ask that we focus on what it means for Jesus to teach us to call God parent, to have that close and that intimate of a relationship, to have that proximity, to have that accessibility 
because how many times have kids have we gone up and interrupted our parents um, because we needed something and our parents were there and might have asked us and worked with us to hold on for a second but would loop back to us. And for the people who did not have parents that they could interrupt or who would be there for them, what does it mean to understand that there is that need supplied somewhere that they can go to? And what does it mean for us as the family of Christ to be physical, tangible witnesses of what true parental love can look like? So we have a parent. We have the closest and nearness of a parent. But then all of a sudden we go far, right? Our Father who art in heaven. And all of a sudden that closeness, that proximity, that hug, that fresh baked cookie that's waiting for us is all of a sudden in the cosmos, in the heavens. May we never forget how big God is. May we never get so used to the comfortable nearness that we think we can put God in our back pocket and make God to fit whatever our needs are, as if we are in control and God becomes a Santa Claus checklist that we can pull out whenever we want something. There is something beyond us. Just as this prayer starts with our instead of my, as soon as we are reassured of the nearness of God's presence, we are also reminded of God's greatness. And in that proximity and in that greatness, we ask for God's name to be hallowed. We ask ourselves to remember that God's name is holy and this comes in the imperative sense. So we are also asking for God to be holy. Do you remember back when we were talking about living in the already and the not yet? So there are, there are times where everything is right in the world. There's justice. There's loving kindness. There's peace. There's righteousness. And then there are all times, right, when there's brokenness and pain and harm and none of that goodness. Jesus has not yet returned. God's will is not yet fully done on earth as it is in heaven. But there are glimpses of when it is. So it's both and. And this prayer has that both and in it. In hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. We remember who you are and what you have done and what you have accomplished. And we also ask you to keep doing the work. And as we meet up against the injustice or the pain or the brokenness that we see when we can't put another foot in front of the other, holy be your name. Bring your holiness here. And so when we sing, blessed be your name, what does it mean to find holiness in both the times of the already where the streams of abundance flow? And in the not yet, in the desert places. What does it mean to find holiness there? And what does it mean to be people who hold faith in those places? And who desperately look and ask for something different in those places? who don't run away from those places, but stay in them to find God's holiness there and to find a little bit more of who we are too, to not shy away from those places where God asks us to grow and to find more, not just of God as parent, reassuring us that God will be with us every step of the way as God asks for more of us, but God is creator of the cosmos who's ready for us to have a little bit bigger understanding of who God is, to be able to see God a little more widely. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. May we never forget the strength 
and the power of that holiness and that name. I had a Jewish colleague praying for me this past week, and she sent me a text um, saying of the prayer of healing that she had been chanting for me and ended it with, um, God hold you, but said God slash D. So it's the G slash D. Because of the Jewish practice, not ever fully writing out or naming Yahweh, the name of God, because it is too sacred, it is too big, it is too holy to name, and, and has carried that practice even in for God, which we could speak verbally, but even in the writing, still not including that, oh, just as the reminder of how great and how holy and how sacred God is. And what a gift to know that you're in a hard place and to have a visual reminder in front of you of how much bigger God is than that hard place, of how much power there actually is in God's name of how holy and sacred it is, and how we as children of God can cry out to our parent, as we sang in the cantata, and God will come and save us. Not just when we accept Christ as Lord, but when we're trying to figure out what that means and how to live that way. This is why we are here to pray together, to open heart, soul, mind, and strength, to receive more of that power so that we can be more of who we are created to be. Amen.